All right. Good evening, everyone. Good to see you tonight. Welcome once again to our uh, Unlock Revelation series. And uh, for those of you that are watching online, we're glad that you're with us. And this evening, we're going to be looking at three angels with a message. We've come up to the point in our study of Revelation of Revelation 13, and now we're moving into Revelation 14. So that introduces to us three angels that have some very special messages for us. Now, tomorrow night, I'm going to uh, adjust the schedule a little bit. I'm going to talk about my own personal encounter with God and the three angels. So we'll be dealing with that uh, testimony tomorrow evening at 7 o'clock. And then we'll continue with the schedule that will go on to Tuesday night. And that will be the secret weapon of the 144,000. So we'll check that out because in Revelation 14, we're being introduced to the 144,000. And we'll talk a little bit more about that tonight. And then uh, the next night, that would be Wednesday night, life after the mark of the beast. So what happens after the mark of the beast? Is there, is there any life after the mark of the beast? So we'll take a look at that as we uh, get into it. So that's kind of the short version of what's coming up. And uh, we want to go ahead and have a word of prayer. And then we're going to have a drawing and special music. So let's, let's have prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, Lord, tonight as we continue our series and we look into Revelation 14, we want to thank you for the opportunity to study your book and to understand it. And so bless us tonight with your holy presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we do have a drawing tonight, so I don't know if we've got all that stuff in the basket. We'll have a have somebody draw that. We've got somebody that hasn't. Uh, maybe we'll have Joseph. Yeah. Oh, okay. Linda gets the pick. What's that? Well, we put one in for you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we have another special music tonight from the the world famous um, no um, um, Portland famous um, our church famous. <laughs> They're going to have a special music for us tonight. So, their turn. I'd like to share it's actually a hymn a very well-known hymn back in I think 1872 possibly this was written or the words were matching the music anyway it's called when I survey the wondrous cross thought it was a fitting one for the weekend to focus to think about the cross so <laughs> Thank you. 
Beautiful. Thank you very much. All right, we're we're up and running again. All right, well, let's have a word, another word of prayer before we get into God's word, shall we? Father in heaven, Lord, once again, we want to thank you for the word of of uh, from your heart, this love letter that you've sent to us. And this special letter, Lord, is the one that you gave that is the last in the Bible. And as the last letter that you have sent to mankind, it holds enormous value for us. And so, Lord, as we continue to unlock Revelation, we pray that your Holy Spirit would continue to guide us and direct our hearts. Please give us ears to hear, Lord, what you're speaking to your church tonight. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, some of you may, be, uh, have, may have been wondering that if the things that we've been learning in this seminar are true, uh, for instance, the mark of the beast, the seal of God, the, the true Sabbath, uh, the identity of each of these beasts, etc. If this is all true, why isn't God warning us about what's about to happen. Why, after we looked at Revelation 13 and this confederacy of, of evil you know, coming down the line, why hasn't he been warning us about it? Well, the reality is, is he has been for over 180 years. In fact, in Revelation 10, verse 1, let's remind ourselves of a very special message that we that we were introduced to uh, through this mighty angel. Verse one, I saw still another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, and a rainbow was on his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land. And he cried with a loud voice as when a lion roars, when he cried out, the seven thunders uttered their voices. So I went, in, went to the angel and I said to him, give me the little book. And he said to me, take and eat it and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. So we remember this prophecy, right? And it was a prophecy that told about how uh, a special message of the end of the 2,300 year prophecy would take place. But then notice what the angel says to John after uh, that bitter experience. And he said to you, you must prophesy what? Again, 
about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. And so after this special message was proclaimed in 1844, the angel, and they had the bitter experience where Jesus did not come like they thought he should, then the angel, they found out, had really told them that they must prophesy again. In other words, they must preach again. And so let's remember the time period that we're looking at here. The first beast rises up out of the sea in 530, by, by 538. Uh, the beast makes war against the saints for 1,260 years. And then we have the beast receiving a mortal wound in 1798 as the Pope is taken prisoner by uh, Napoleon's army. And then at the same time, we see the rise of this second beast, uh, coming from the earth, and we identified that as the United States of America. And then right after that period is when these three angels should be beginning to preach. And so what we're looking at tonight is something that Peter calls in, in 2 Peter 1.12, present truth. He says, therefore, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know them and are established in the present truth. Now, that's a special phrase that he uses because he's referring to to not just to general truth. In other words, all the truth of the of the word of God. But he's talking about something that's very present at a specific time. And of course, in their time, it was the truth about Christ. And so what we're going to be looking at tonight is what is considered present truth for our time. In fact, we found this, I, I talked about this a little bit earlier, but we, we found that God always sends a message to prepare his people for major worldwide events which affect their eternal destiny. And we see this principle first revealed to us actually in the Garden of Eden. We looked at Genesis 2 verse 17, and God said to Adam, he said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest of it thereof, thou shalt surely die. So even though it's not what you would call a cataclysmic event uh, to us, it certainly was for them, wasn't it? To not abide by this truth, this present truth. Now, do we still have a tree of knowledge of good and evil out there somewhere that we need to avoid eating from? Well, we could say yeah, in a symbolic way, but we don't have a literal tree like they did. So that message that God gave them was present truth. It was very special for that time. And of course, we know about the flood. There was this very special message that was present truth for them at the time of the flood. So God has an end time message that is designed to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus. And in Revelation's message here, this end time message, it is number one, that we should obey God. Number two, that we should glorify God. And number three, that we should worship God. So we're going to take a look at this message tonight and see what it's all about. But as we, um, as we do this, we recognize that the last day warning, uh, warns us against the devil's deceptions at this period of time. We have established the fact that that is the devil's M.O. He's constantly in the process of deceiving us, right? And he's deceiving us for the express purpose of drawing attention to himself or seeking our, our worship. The message of Revelation 14 is an appeal to surrender completely to him and commit our lives to following his truth. By the way, how many truths are there out there? <laughs> well, you could make a case for everybody saying, well, I've got my own personal truth, right? I mean, if you ask people, they would say, well, you know, I, I want to worship God the way I want to, or I have a special truth that, you know, is pertinent to me. That's what we call relativism, that everybody seems to have their own truth. And by the way, there's a lot of people arguing online that there they have the truth. No, I have the truth. No, it's over here, that sort of thing. But as our pastor said, there is really only one truth, and we found that in the Word of God. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to take a look at this truth that God reveals to us. And, and what we see here in Revelation 14, verse 6, 
is that John says, then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. What's interesting about this phrase is that's almost identical to the one of the angel in Revelation 10, where he said, you must prophesy it again, remember, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, in a sense. So what event does this message prepare all humanity for? I mean, the angel says that he's got the everlasting gospel, but how do we know what event it's preparing us for? Because we established the concept earlier here that God always has a message to prepare people for a cataclysmic event, right? For something that's pretty dramatic. So what is it? Well, if we look at the end of chapter thir- uh, chapter 14, we get a very clear understanding of that. Verse 14, after talking about the, what these three angels' messages is, he concludes the chapter starting in verse 14 by saying, I looked and b- there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man. So who is known as the son of man in scripture? That's Jesus, right? with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called with a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap because the time to reap has come for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So what is this harvest? What's the meaning of Revelation's harvest? We have this picture that John has given of Jesus sitting on a cloud. He's got a sickle in his hand, scepter in the other, and the angel tells him to take the sickle and reap for the harvest is ripe. So how do we know what the harvest is? Well, Jesus tells us in Matthew 13, 39, the enemy that sowed them is the devil and the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. So we recognize that this is none other than the second coming, right? The harvest is the end of the world. This is when Jesus comes back uh, from heaven to take us home with him, amen? It's the time of the resurrection of the sleeping saints and those that are alive are caught up to together with them and and to to go home. So, So we see then that it is logical to conclude that the three angels that are in the first part of this chapter are preparing people for what event? The second coming, right? That's the cataclysm. That's the huge um, elephant in the room, you might say, at the end of time. They're preparing them for the second coming. Now, when um, we know that this is uh, being preached before the second coming, right? These three angels. But it has to be after the mortal wound. So we're trying to locate when this three angels message is going to be preached. We know it has to be after the mortal wound. And also it has to be around the time of 1844 because there is a very significant thing that the first angel tells us that we'll kind of uh, get into in just a second here. So let's look at it. And actually, uh, before we do that, let's go ahead and read the first part of Revelation 14. Verse one, then I looked and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. Now what does Mount Zion represents? Well, we, we represent, we, we look, when we looked at trying to identify a woman in Bible prophecy, we remember reading how uh, God called his church, his a- ancient Israel, the daughter of Zion. Remember that? And Mount Zion was the name for Jerusalem, the mountain and the area that they were, that it was located on. So Mount Zion is on earth. So these are people he's seen standing with Jesus on earth on Mount Zion. And it says that there was 144,000 having his father's name written on their forehead. So these 144,000, this is a multiple of 12. The 12 tribes of Israel made up all of Israel, and 12 times 12 is 144,000. Well, 12,000, I should say, times 12,000. So so this is a symbol of the complete number of God's people that have not followed the beast power 
in the last days. Now, remember when we talked about the other night, we talked about how Revelation 14, when it introduces the 144,000, uh, and, and we talked about the Bride of Christ, it's showing those that are actually resisting the mark of the beast, right? Resisting following the beast power. So these are those, it said, it goes on to say in uh, verse 2, and I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of th loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could, could learn that song except the 144,000 and those who, who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Now, what this means, again, we have to remember that Revelation is a, a book of many symbols, right? We know that women represent what in Bible prophecy? A church, right? So we're not talking about uh, the only ones that are going to be saved are going to be literal virgins here. Otherwise, most of the planet Earth would be left out. But we're talking about here women representing a church, and we know that as we looked at the Bride of Christ, there are actually two women that are highlighted in Revelation. There's the pure woman of Revelation 12, we recognize was the pure church. And then we're going to be studying in a future lesson here, not too long, the impure woman in Revelation 17, who represents a apostate church. So these are the ones who don't defile themselves with apostate church, okay? Those that are not following of us, saith the Lord. And then it says this about them in verse four. These are the ones who follow the lamb, how far? Wherever he goes. Now, this is an important statement here because what did we learn about the power of the beast power in Revelation 13? That it said that all the world followed the beast, right? Wondered after the beast and followed it. So it's giving us a hint that actually not everybody has followed him, right? And that's good news to us because it tells us that even though the power of Satan, the power of the beast is going to be massive and it's going to have a definite effect on planet Earth, there are some that are able to resist him, right? It's the, those that follow the lamb and they follow exactly what Jesus asked them to do. Verse 4, continuing, These were redeemed from the men, among men, being firstfruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Guile is just a simple, another word for lies, you know, and, and falsehoods. So they don't tell lies, they tell the truth. And obviously it is the truth of God that they're sharing. They share it in love. So that's the introduction to chapter 14. Now let's go to the screen and continue to look at what the first angel says. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having what? The everlasting gospel. If you were going to describe to people what is the gospel, what would you say? What would it be composed of? Well, we would, we would ask, we would say that it is uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Paul says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, that's part of the gospel, and that he was buried, that's part of the scripture, and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. Now, it's important that it's, it's this, this statement here is modified by, by according to the scripture. Every time he says this, he says that Christ died for our sins, according to the scripture, okay? Um, that he was buried and that he rose again, according to the scripture. So in other words, it's pointing to the, the Bible as true in pointing to us the, the, the truth of, of, the, of the scriptures, of, of the, the everlasting gospel. Revelation 13, 8 says, Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So every... Uh, from, from the very beginning, there has been this gospel presentation, this good news that God would send his son someday to save us from our sins. So it's everlasting in the sense, uh, as far as it goes from 
for the, the case of mankind that it's been from the very beginning of our history. The everlasting gospel can be said to be Christ died for our sins, Christ lived a pers perfect life, Christ rose from the dead, and Christ ascended to the Father. It also can be seen summed up in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, this is a powerful statement here that we often, we quote, but we don't really realize sometimes exactly what it means. When it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, did he just give him to us for 33 years? Because that's the time period of, from uh, Jesus' birth and to his death on the cross, right? So it appears as though, while well, he just gave him to us for a while. He just loaned him to us. The reality is, friends, is that God has given us his son for eternity. Jesus will always have the scars in his hands. That's what the Bible teaches us. He is, he is given to us as our salvation. That is the everlasting good news that he will always be our savior. And then in Matthew 1, verse 21, when the angel was announcing the birth of Jesus, he said, and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Not only is Jesus going to forgive us our sins, not only is he going to take our place in the punishment, but he's also going to save us from our sins, not in our sins, but from our sins. Now that, my friends, is good news. And so Ephesians 1 verse 7 also says, in him we have redemption. He is the one that redeems us. So all of these things make up the everlasting gospel. And we actually see it in the sanctuary service. That's where the, the Lord first uh, revealed to them in a very systematic way the everlasting gospel. Because every facet of the sanctuary service in ancient Israel was showing that God was providing for them what they could not provide for themselves. And so it's a beautiful illustration of what God prov provided. The angel goes on in verse 7. He says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. So we're going to take this apart and we're going to take a look at this message, this present truth for this time because we need to know what it is. If it's true that Jesus' coming is right on the threshold here, then don't we need to understand the message that he sent to prepare us? So let's take a look at it and see if we can dissect it here. So the first thing he says after the everlasting gospel is fear God. All right. So what is it that we have a problem with in this day and age? Uh, and Ecclesiastes, uh, Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13, he said, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. When you look at the book of, of Ecclesiastes, this is the story of Solomon's confession. You might remember how Solomon started off on the right foot, didn't he? He was walking with God. God gave him wisdom. He was renowned for his wisdom. And Solomon praised God and uplifted God. And his, his nation of Israel prospered under that. But you might remember how he fell away, right? He began to do things that God did not want him to do. He ended up with a thousand wives at the end. And by the time it was all said and done, fortunately, he repented. And we see his repentance in the book of Ecclesiastes. And so when, when he gets done, when he comes to the last, very last things that he's going to say in Ecclesiastes, he kind of sums it up. And he says, you know, looking back at my life of, of sin and foolishness, he says, really, this is the, this is the essence of what we need to do. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. So exactly what does it mean to fear God? Well, in Revelation 13 and 14, we have two kinds of fears that are revealed here. In Revelation 13, with the beast power uh, wielding his big stick, what kind of fear is that? 
That's the fear where you cower, right? Because he's bigger than you are, and he's he's threatening you with economic uh, boycott and also with with death if you don't respond. So that's the kind of fear that worshiping the beast involves. But when it comes to worshiping uh, the fear of worshiping the creator, God doesn't work that way. Now, I know that there's some people that think that God works that way, but that is a false picture of God because the fear of God is different than that. In fact, to fear God means to respect or reverence God by obeying him. When you, when you uh, love your parents, you fear them as a child, not in the sense because they're going to uh, give you corporal punishment, be- kids, you know, because you might do something, but because you respect their position. You respect the fact that they're the ones that brought you into the world. And so we do that with God. And you know today, friends, is there a, is there a dearth, is there a, um, a problem with fearing God? Yeah, there's, there's so many people that are not fearing God in the right way today. There's a lot of people that don't believe in God anymore. In fact, the latest statistics out for the United States are that there are more and more uh, atheists and people that claim no religious affiliation than there ever has been in the entire existence of, of, of the United States. Wow. It's an incredible reality that we used to be what was called a Christian nation, and we were uh, easily over 50%, you know, up to the 70s and the 80s and things like that, percentage of us that believe God and even went to, to church. But today, the latest statistics show that we are not there. There definitely is a need today, friends, in fearing God. Uh, also, you can look at, at the old world over in Europe. It's even worse over there. Now, America is still known as a Christian nation, although I, I kind of wonder exactly what kind of Christian they're thinking about. But over in Europe, it's even worse. That is where there was a lot of Christian influence over the centuries for thousands, uh, even uh, millions of millions, uh, thousands of years. But today, it's hard to get people to go to church in, 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 uh, in, in Europe. And so it's uh, even worse over there. So definitely we're in a time where people need to come back to reverencing God as they should. The angel continues. We looked at fear God. And then he says, and give glory to him. So what does it mean to give glory to God? Well, the Bible tells us what it means. We can actually... uh, form an opinion ourselves or a definition ourselves, but we want the Bible to tell us what it means to glorify God. And so in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 31, Paul says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the what? To the glory of God. So in other words, this concept here is that because we fear God, because we love God, we reverence him, we recognize that we have our existence because of God, we want to glorify him. We want to do whatever we do, we want it to be a blessing or a, a, a positive response to him. And so we do those things to be uh, that are pleasing in his sight. Now, what we have today, though, in our world is pretty opposite to that. In fact, this is a real uh, uh, license place in California. Uh, me first, right? We are the me generation kind of a thing. And uh, then, of course, uh, Time did a, a whole magazine on this a while back where it said it's all about me. And so even people in journalism and lots of different places are realizing the focus of our society today is really centered on us, right? It's not centered on God. It's centered on giving glory to self. And that's what what happens when you look at, for instance, YouTube. Now, it doesn't, I'm not saying that it's bad to have a YouTube channel, but when you look at a lot of the YouTube channels and things like that, who are they bringing glory to? They're bringing glory to themselves. Uh, you have, you've heard about these social influencers. These, these people that are usually pretty good looking and very, very, um, 
uh, capable in a lot of ways, they are getting lots of likes, lots of hits, and all the stuff that they put out is focusing on themselves. You have Facebook pages. And again, if you've got a Facebook page, it's not, I'm not saying that you, you're all about yourself, but a lot of this is focusing on self. We are the me generation today. And so what's happening is we're glorifying self. We lift up sports figures. We lift up celebrities in Hollywood. We lift up people that are beautiful, people that are strong. And it's all about giving glory to mankind. But the third or the first angel says that this is a time, especially when we need to be thinking about glorifying God. Amen. That's what he's saying here. This is going to help us prepare for the second coming. Because after all, if you're focusing on yourself and you're thinking about yourself and your Facebook page or your Twitter account or whatever, are you really getting ready for the second coming? Now, if you're, if you're presenting the truth of God to people through that, that's a different story. But if you're only focusing on glorifying yourself, then you're not preparing to meet your Savior when he comes in the clouds of glory. So the angel, the first angel, continues, and he says, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Now this pinpoints us in the stream of time, because the angel says the reason that you want to fear God, the reason you want to give him glory, is because what? The hour of his judgment has come. All right? So that's an important point there. So we know that when we, we, we studied the 2,300 day prophecy of Daniel 8.14, that we found that it comes to a conclusion down in 1844. This pinpoints us, friends, in the stream of time. It's like one of those, those uh, road markers that it allows us to know where we're at in the stream of prophecy. And we know it's true because the baptism of Jesus came right on time. Jesus was crucified right on time. All of these things were 100% accurate. Therefore, we know that as the end of the 2,300 year prophecy comes down to 1844, that we have now entered the time of God's judgment. It's the time where Jesus has moved from the holy place into the most holy place and is interceding for us. It, it's all about the sanctuary service. It is the key that we found that unlocks revelation for us and helps us to see where we're at. We saw this in, in an overview before. We are now down here in Revelation 12 through 22. We're at 14 now, but we're in the time of the most holy place. And we know from the study of the sanctuary that the entering into the most holy place was the day of atonement, which the Jewish people understood was the uh, a day of judgment. All right. So that's where we're at in the stream of time. That's what the angel, the second, the first angel is saying. He's not done yet. We're still with the first angel. He goes on to say, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Now, when we looked at the seal of God, we noticed that in Exodus 20, verse 11, where it has the Sabbath commandment, we saw a parallel of these, these verses here, uh, that the angel says that we should worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea. And we see in the middle of the Ten Commandments, we have the God who made the heavens, the earth, and the sea. And so we see that there is a link there with the fourth commandment. So it's the time the angel is saying that we need to be called back to worshiping the creator who made heaven and earth and the seas. Amen. Do we need to be called back to that today? Well, I mean, we can add to what we talked about, about fearing God, you know, that people aren't fearing God that much. We have a whole society, a whole world today that has a, a problem with worshiping God as they should. It's a time where, in fact, uh, we have a theory that has come into our existence that never was there before. Now, I, I, I should be careful about that because even back in ancient Greece, there were some of the philosophers that, that kind of rummaged around with the concept that maybe we were born a different way. Maybe we weren't created by the gods. However, 
realistically speaking, when you look at it historically, it wasn't until the 1800s that this concept that we might not have been created by God really blossomed, it really took off. And so we're dealing with a time where a huge portion of the Earth's population are believing in evolution that there, in fact, was no God involved in our creation. It's a time where, where we don't realize that this has had an incredible effect on, on our ability to be prepared for the second coming. Now, there's a book that came out a while back, and the title is The Foundations of the Origin of Species. That's Darwin's book. Two essays written in 1844 and eight, or 1842 and 1844, Charles Darwin. This is talking about the fact that Darwin began to put his book together on the origin of species in uh, 1842 and 1844. The book, uh, Origin of Species, which brought in the concept of evolution and no God involved was actually published in uh, 1859. But the origins of it go back to 1842 and 1844. Now, what do we know happened in 1844? That, according to our prophecy, is when the angel began to preach that we need to go back to worshiping God, right? Isn't it amazing? that God would give a message about coming back to worship him right at the time when he knew Satan would bring up a theory that would move everybody away from worshiping God. And so from that point on in 1844 and on, and when Darwin's book came out in 59, uh, the whole world took it by storm. Or I should say it took the whole world by storm. And so we live in an age of evolution. And so now the angel says it's time that we need to restore the, the truth about creation, about who is really the creator of this planet and this universe. So it's all about worshiping the creator or worshiping the beast. Jesus said in John 4, 22, you worship what you do not know to the Samaritan woman. We know what we worship. Friends, the Bible is one of those confrontational books sometimes where it tells us the truth and it's hard to take. And so this is a statement actually that can be said or spoken to everybody who does not believe in God. That we know what we worship. Those of us who have accepted the Bible, we know what we worship. You don't know what you worship. Uh, speaking of evolutionist and all. All right, it continues now, and we come to the second angel in Revelation 14, verse 8. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, as we look at this second angel, and it identifies, and it says that Babylon has fallen, we're going to actually look at the subject of Babylon in a future lesson, not too far from here. But we'll just share a, a couple of things here. In Revelation 18, verse 4, it gives a, another angel that adds to this angel's message about Babylon. John says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. In other words, come out of Babylon lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. So Babylon was an entity that God wanted his people to come out of. In fact, it, has, it harkens back to the Babylonian captivity of Israel. And as God called them to come back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple and the city, they were to come out of Babylon, out of the, the pagan uh, rituals that had taken over Babylon because Babylon was going to be destroyed. So uh, in Revelation thir or 17, verse 3, here is where we see, begin to see a little bit of the picture of Babylon. We'll just touch on it tonight and we'll see some more a little bit in detail later on. So the angel carried John, uh, me away, it says, in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. So this is a woman that it represents a church 
which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. So as, it inter as he introduces Babylon in Revelation 17, he sees this woman sitting on a scarlet beast, having seven heads and ten horns. Now, if you remember the prophecies of Daniel and also of Revelation 13, that should ring a bell, those seven heads and ten horns. So this woman represented a church sitting on a beast with seven heads and ten horns is probably not a good woman. Okay, just from that uh, description. But unfortunately, it goes on to describe her even more uh, in the next verses. We won't look at that. But here is what it says in verse 5. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So uh, in this short description tonight, we realize that Babylon is not a good thing. It's not a good place to be. And so the second angel is calling us to come out of Babylon. Now, this woman has in her hand wine, and wine represents false doctrine in the book of Revelation here. Babylon symbolizes a system of religious confusion. So the second angel is calling God's people in the last days to come out of that religious confusion. And we've been looking at some of that religious confusion, uh, haven't we? Since the Dark Ages, with the, when the Bible was chained in the monasteries, so much of the truth of God's word was lost. But we've seen since those days, since the 1400s, that more and more of the truth of God's word has been coming out to the people. So let's now take a look at the third angel's message. Revelation 14, verse 9. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So we looked at the mark of the beast the other night, and some people think that the third angel's message is all about the mark of the beast and nothing else. What we're going to see tonight is there's a lot more to it than just that. Certainly the mark of the beast is important, but it's a time where in, in preparing God's people, when God is preparing his people for the second coming, he says this is important as well. We're to fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. We're to come out of Babylon, he says, in the second angel. And now the third angel says that we need to avoid this mark of the beast. So let's remind ourselves that the central issue regarding the mark of the beast is worship. When the mark of the beast is sought to be enforced, it's all about worshiping the first beast, right? Instead of God. And, and so the first angel wants us to fear God and give glory to him, which is all about worship. Now, as we look at this, we know who's behind that. We've established that from the very beginning when we identified the dragon, that the one that is behind the scenes of redirecting people to worship God in a different way that he's prescribed is the devil. He's not wanting us to worship God as he, as he designed. But you know, in the midst of that uh, and all the, the pressure and all the, the persecution that's going to be poured out upon people who are not wanting to follow the beast, we know that Jesus is there ministering for, to, for us in the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. We know that he's there between the, uh, uh, the cherubim in the most holy place. We're talking about Jesus when, when the, the beast power is seeking to persecute people and people are running for fear. We know that Jesus is there interceding for us and he will be there for us. But then the third angel continues after introducing the mark of the beast and warning us not to receive it. He goes on in verse 12 and he says, here is the what? The patience of the saints. Now, this is a very important part of the third angel. How many of you are patient people? How many of you like to wait in line for things? How many of you uh, like to wait on your parents to get ready to go someplace when you've been ready an hour ago or whatever it may be, right? We all get into different situations where we, our, our patience is tested. 
Here is a situation where the third angel says that we are going to need patience as we wait for Jesus to come. Because just like when you pray for something, you ask the Lord to provide for you something, and it doesn't come when you want it to, what happens? You get frustrated, right? And, and you get, you, sometimes you get to the point where you try to answer the prayer yourself, right? Just like Abraham and Sarah, remember that he, he promised them a son, and they waited, and they waited, and they waited, and finally, Sarah got to about 90 years old, and they still hadn't had a son. And so they tried to help God out. Remember that? And she gave Hagar uh, to, to uh, her, her husband, Abraham. But that wasn't what God wanted. And so you see there that sometimes God wants to develop our patience as well as have us be patient. And so the angel tells us that we need to be patient. We need to have the patience of the saints. And the only place that you can get patience is from God. The kind of patience that you're able to wait on the Lord, right? The, the kind of patience that we don't have. And so the third angel tells us we need to be patient. But then he says um, also that we need to be keeping the commandments of God. That's the second part of this, that here's the patience of the saints. Here are they who keep the commandments of God. Um, get the other one in there. So in this time period, it's going to be extremely important, important, the third angel says, that we need to be following God's will because that is going to be helping us to prepare for the second coming. Now, why is that so? Well, what's fascinating about this particular word here, uh, keep, I don't know if I have the definition here. Yes, I do. Uh, I think I no mentioned it the other night. It literally means in the Greek to guard or preserve or to hold fast from loss or injury. So it's like something precious that you're guarding, see? Now, oftentimes we just think of keep the commandments. It means to do it, you know? It's like do it and, and obey it kind of a thing. Uh, and that's part of it. But what God is telling us through the third angels is we need to guard God's commandments. We need to keep them, protect them from injury, from, from being lost even, as it were, because the commandments are what is going to protect us as we go through a very sinful time, right? When you find yourself keeping the commandments of God, you're actually protected from all the sin in the world. You see, the, the commandments are protection for us to keep us from falling into sin. And so by the power of Christ, by the grace that God gives us, he wants us, the third angel is saying, we need to guard, we need to keep those commandments, and it will help us to be ready for his second coming. Because after all, if you're keeping the commandments, are you falling into sin? No, you're not. And some people will say, well, pastor, you can't keep the commandments. You can't, you can't overcome like that. But what does the Bible say? The Bible says that he wants us to keep the commandments. If it was not possible to keep the commandments, what, what, what was it that Jesus said? Well, let's go back even further. Let's go back to God's counsel to Cain. He told him, you know, to, 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 um, to not basically kill his brother. He says, it's desire is for you, but you should overcome it, right? You should master it. So he was telling Cain that you really have the ability by God's grace to resist the desire to kill your brother. And then of course, there's the woman that was caught in adultery. You might remember that. She was thrown down at his feet. The Pharisees said, um, the, the Bible says that we should stone this woman. She was caught in the very act of adultery. And what, what does Jesus say at the end? He says, who, those of you that are without sin cast the first stone. Well, of course, all of them knew that they weren't uh, sinless, right? But then what does he say to the woman at the very end? He says, where are your accusers, woman? And has anybody accused you? And she said, no one, sir. And he says, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Now, Listen to this, friends. If it is not possible to overcome sin, that was the most horrible thing that Jesus could say to that woman. 
because for the rest of her life, she would be trying to overcome a sin that supposedly she had no power to overcome. But the fact that Jesus asked her to do it means that it's possible by God's grace. Now, you and I know that. We can overcome lying. We can overcome speeding if we just ask for grace, you know, to overcome the the desire to do it, whatever it may be. And so the, the commandments are there to help us prepare for the second coming. And so we know those commandments are important because when God gave them, how did he give them? Did he write them in pencil on a piece of paper? No, you know why we use paper, uh, pencils, right? So you can erase things, erase the mistakes. God didn't do that. He wrote them where? On stone. When was the last time you wrote anything on stone? What is what kind of what kind of um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? What kind of attitude or what kind of of, of um, statement does that make to you that something is written on stone? Yeah, this is yeah, this is this is a permanent record, right? When you write something on stone, when you engrave it on stone, it is meant to be permanent. And he writes it with his finger. I I've never written anything with my finger except maybe uh, what is it the the finger painting, right? And so this is a permanent record. And then of course Jesus in in the New Testament he says, "Think not that I've come to destroy the law, but I've come to fulfill it." Right? He uplifts the law. And then everything in the Sermon on the Mount is all about how he magnifies the law. He shows that he's come to lift it up. And then, of course, when we open, when the temple was opened in heaven in Revelation eleven nineteen, we saw the Ark of the Covenant. And what's in the Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments. So we've learned that the Ten Commandments are still important, and that is what we are judged by. In fact, friends, we need to emphasize this this this, this evening as well, because the entire law, how much did I say? The entire law is summed up in one word, and that is love. Love to God and love to your fellow man. That's what Jesus said. That's what he told the, the, the lawyer when he asked him. Love is what the Bible, uh, what the, the commandments is all about. Love leads to, rebe- to obedience. It is what it's all about. It always leads to obedience is what love does. All right, so... Jesus said, verse uh, uh, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. All right. Now, James 2, verse 10 through 11 says, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. And then he describes what law he's talking about. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not mow. Murder. So throughout the New Testament, we see that the law is lifted up. It is still there, but it is only kept through love. And the angel says it's vitally important to have that. Revelation 14, 12, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. And now we look at something else. Who keep what? The faith of Jesus. You see, friends, when people study the, the, the third angel's message and this mark of the beast thing, they focus so often just on the mark of the beast. And certainly it's an, it's an important subject, but you can see here that there's still a lot more of the third angel's message, right? So not only do we need to keep the commandments of God and have the patience of the saints, but we need to keep the faith of Jesus as well. The Greek indicates that we're supposed to keep them too. We're supposed to guard it and protect it. So the question we need to ask tonight is, what is the faith of Jesus? What does that mean? Well, when we look at Jesus on the cross and what he did, we can see the results of the faith of Jesus. Let's go back to Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, and let's look at that one again because we looked at that the other night. Paul says, for by grace you have been saved through what? Through faith. It's the gift of God, not of yourselves, not not of works, lest anyone should boast. So here is what we typically do. We think that the faith that that you have been saved by, uh, you have been saved through faith. We think of the faith as our own. 
That's typically what people say. We put our faith in Jesus. And that's true. We did put our faith in Jesus. But whose faith really saves us? You see, if you, if you look at this as your own faith, then you kind of have a part in your salvation. And we don't really have a part in our salvation. Jesus did it all for us. And so we're looking at it tonight as the faith of Jesus that is what saved us. It's not of ourselves, right? This faith is not of ourselves. It's of Jesus. So what is this faith of Jesus? It's the faith that he had, the trust in his heavenly father, that he was willing to be born as a helpless baby. Think about that, friends. How much trust does that have to to uh, allow your father to bring you into existence and you are a helpless baby and you know that somebody wants you dead? Right? The devil wants Jesus dead. He, he doesn't want him to live, and we know that from the history. What did Herod try to do with all the babies in Bethlehem? He destroyed them. Why? He wanted him dead, and the devil was behind that. So the faith of Jesus is the, the faith, the trust that Jesus had before he came here, that he was willing to trust his father to take care of him, that he was willing to be born as a baby. It's the faith of Jesus that he was willing to grow up as a little child on this planet, knowing all the temptations that would come to him. And of course, he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth, right? Jesus was born on the right side of the tracks? No, he was born in Nazareth. That was like the, the worst of the worst places to live. And so he was born where all kinds of sin abounded. That took a lot of faith. And remember, friends, that Jesus is born understanding his mission. It grows on him as he grows, but, but as he grows up, he finds himself in the midst of a sinful place. It takes a lot of faith and trust in his father to believe that he can keep him from being killed and, and falling into sin. It's the faith of Jesus as he grows up into adolescence that he, he studies the Bible and he, he shares it with others and, and that he's not going to be misdirected by the mighty teachers of Israel who are actually not teaching the Bible anymore. And so Jesus had trust in his father to help him through that. It's the faith of Jesus as he, he begins his ministry. He chooses 12 men to be his disciples and he knows what's in their hearts. He knows that one of them is a devil. He knows that all of them are going to forsake him, that even his, his best uh, disciple is going to deny him three times. And yet he continues to stay with it. How many of us would have given up at that point? When we know the writings on the wall, hey, I'm, am I going to get to the end of this mission? Am I going to be able to complete the work that the Father has given me to do? I've got, I've got 12 guys that are going to deny me. One's going to betray me, and, and, and I'm going to end up being crucified. It's the faith of Jesus as he went into the Garden of Gethsemane, Gethsemane and all the sins of the world are placed upon him. And the guilt of the world. Do you remember the last time you felt guilty for doing something wrong? Was that an easy load to carry? No, I, I remember the times that I felt guilty. and one, one person's guilt, my guilt, was enough to crush me. We're talking about Jesus being willing to trust his father, have faith in his father to get him through this, that he's okay, he's going to let that load of every single man, woman, and child that's ever lived to fall upon him. That, my friend, is faith and trust. If you're willing to go through that and continue to the the end result. And then there's Jesus' uh, faith in the middle of the Garden of Gethsemane, or I mean, at the, well, when he's betrayed by Judas. You see, every step through Jesus' life, he reveals an incredible and astonishing faith that is rock solid. He's not moved one inch. Our faith, oh, our trust in God, 
it's so so wishy-washy, right? It goes up and it goes down. Depends on how the wind blows. But Jesus' faith is rock solid. And even know, though he knows the end result of what's going to happen, he stays put. And when he's nailed to the cross, it's the faith of Jesus. Because after all, how much power did Jesus have? Could he have come down from the cross? Certainly, he could have kept it from happening any point during this time of his ministry. But his trust in his father, his faith in the plan of salvation was such that he stayed put. He stayed on that cross. And beloved, because he stayed put, you and I have salvation today. You and I have the ability to accept him as our personal savior and and be saved. And so this is the faith that the third angel is talking about. And that's the faith that the martyrs in ancient time uh, took into their lives. That's what enabled them to be, to, to, to be tied to those posts and burned at the stake. It wasn't their own faith because that was so weak and vacillating. It was the faith of Jesus. It was that gift, that divine gift that he gave them that enabled them to stay put and not deny Jesus. It's that faith that you and I can tap into today when we're tempted by the devil, that we can ask for the faith of Jesus. And so this is the present truth, friends, of the three angels. It's the present truth that is for this day. There was present truth at the time of the sacrifice of Cain and Abel. That present truth was you need to offer a lamb, Cain and Abel. And Abel listened to that present truth and Cain didn't, right? Is that present truth today? No, it was for that time. There's the present to, truth of the, of the flood that Moses or Noah was told to build an ark and to come into the ark. That was present truth. Is that present truth today? No. When Jesus, when, when Noah and his family went into the ark, they were listening to and obeying present truth. But the people that didn't listen to it, the antediluvians, they were lost. They found themselves outside the ark because they had not listened to present truth. In the time of Sodom and Gomorrah and the, and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot was given present truth by the angels. And he went to his family and he said, come with me. The Lord is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Did his family listen to him? Well, some of them did, but most of them didn't, right? They weren't willing to listen to him. And so when they left, the angel also said, don't look behind. Don't look back. That was present truth. Is that present truth today? No, it was designed for that particular time. And so when Moses was leading the children of Israel out of Egyptian bondage, he said to Pharaoh, let my people go. Is that present truth today? No, it was specific for that time. And so in Malachi 3, verse 1, just before the second coming, the Lord had said, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me. And so when, when John the Baptist came, he began to tell the people there is a, that they need to repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That was present truth, preparing them for the first coming. Jesus, when he was here, he gave them a special prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem. Remember that? He said, when you see it surrounded by armies, you know, flee for your lives. That was present truth. And because of that, they, nobody was lost who listened to him in the, in the conflagration against Jerusalem that was destroyed in 70 AD. When the disciples began to go out into the world in the, in Acts, they had present truth, except Jesus as the Messiah. You know, he is the one that was sent by God. And so over and over again, you see this concept of present truth all through the Bible. Today, friends, God is sharing with us present truth in the three angels message. It came right on time after the 1260 years were over, after the 2300 day prophecy. Right then, the three angels message began to be proclaimed. It's proclaimed to prepare people for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And he's knocking on the doors of our hearts. He's knocking on the world's heart tonight through these messages. And friends, it is the message that he did longs for us to, to, to embrace because he wants to take us home. 
Can you imagine as a father or a mother and you're pleading with your children to come out from the, 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 um, from outside and come into shelter because there's a tornado coming or there's a hurricane or something and they won't come. Can you imagine the anguish in your heart as a, as a parent? You're desperately wanting them to be saved and they won't listen. And that's where God is today. He's knocking on the doors of our heart and he wants us to come in because he has a heart that can take us all to heaven. Tonight, friends, this is not just nice information to know that I've been sharing. This is not just knowledge that is fascinating and interesting. This is life and death. Because when the children of Israel did not listen to the present truth of John the Baptist, what happened? They were lost. They were destroyed in the destruction of Israel. It was serious. It was life and death. And this is what God has given us today in this time period, just before the second coming. He's given us a life and death message of the three angels. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth and the sea and and the springs of water. And then Babylon has fallen. Come out of her, my people, and don't receive the mark of the beast. Have the patience of God. Keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. This is his message calling us to be ready for the second coming. How many of you would like to raise your hands and say, I want to listen to this present truth. I want to be ready for the second coming. Praise God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we hear your heart in these messages tonight. We hear the pleading of the heart of our God who loves us so much that he gave us his only begotten son. We hear the heart of of God in this, that he wants to give us the faith of Jesus, the patience of Jesus, that we can be enabled to go through these things that are coming upon the world, that when persecution comes, when disaster comes, when heartache comes, when when the difficulties of life surround us, that he has our back. He has everything we need to be able to resist the devil's designs. And to be able to stand on that day and look up into the clouds and say, Lo, this is our God. When we see that cloud of angels and Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. This is our God. We have waited for him. Father, we have raised our hands tonight because we want to be ready. And we want to heed the three angels messages. And we thank you for it in Jesus name. Amen. All right, as we close tonight, I uh, want to remind you that tomorrow night, I take a little bit of a detour. I want to share with you my personal uh, experience with God and these three angels. Okay, so I, I thought maybe it might be helpful for you to see what that looks like in a practical way of somebody who's had to uh, be confronted by God and then to come into contact with the three angels and what that looks like. So tonight, uh, tomorrow night, we're going to look at that, a personal testimony. And uh, I'm not proud of what what uh, what I went through, but I think it's informative. I think it can be helpful. And so we'll do we'll look at that. Then Tuesday night, we'll be looking at the secret weapon of the 144,000. We'll come back on Tuesday night for that one. So God bless you. And we'll see you tomorrow night. And and praise God for the Uh, Resurrection Sunday that's coming up.